Welcome to the Residual Oil Zone interviews. I'm Chad Terry here with Steve Melzer. Steve is the current president of the CO2 conference and has been studying, researching, and working with residual oil zones for the past eight years. Steve, in a previous interview, you described the stages of production in a reservoir. Uh, would you mind giving us a brief refresher of that? We uh, historically have gone through three stages of production in many, many reservoirs around the country and certainly here in the Permian Basin. The uh, one that starts out in all reservoirs is called primary production. And there you're just drilling into the formation and producing the fluids in it, gas or oil, by its own natural pressure. But eventually that pressure dies off and, and it no longer is economic to produce the well. So you've got to either plug the well or go to the second stage of production, which involves injecting some substance, usually water, uh, to push oil from a converted producing well, which is now an injector well, to uh, the rest of the wells, the producing wells left in the field. And so very often this is called secondary production or water flooding. And then from that, then another group of uh, projects could go into what we call tertiary flooding, a third stage of flooding, wherein you use something besides water something that changes the properties of the oil to make it more mobile within the reservoir and allow you to produce more of that original oil in place in the third stage of production called EOR. So what is a residual oil zone as we're talking about it today? I talked about man's water floods and so what we can do is, is produce more oil after a water flood that we've conducted. Well it turns out mother nature can water flood too and she can invade a oil saturated zone and push oil out just like we did and she leaves behind oil just like we did also and so the question then becomes uh, can we produce oil from that interval and what do we call that interval well we've come to call it a residual oil zone because it's the oil that's left behind after a water flood whether we did it or or, or mother nature did it are there a lot of different types of ROZs? Well, we have identified three different types of residual oil zones. In other words, Mother Nature used different processes to invade uh, a, a paleo trap or a geologic trap that had oil in it. Uh, the one that we've got most prevalent in the Permian Basin is type three, highlighted in the box there at the bottom of this graphic. And what that is, is a lateral sweep of the reservoir, say from an outcrop at the distant part of the basin that sweeps water in and moves the oil out laterally from a reservoir. We find these to be very common and very prevalent in certain basins, and certainly the Permian Basin, and we concentrated on looking at the St. Andrews field. Steve, could you tell us more about residual oil zone type three? Okay, we have in the Permian Basin a prevalent type, which is this type 3 ROZ, and this is the laterally swept uh, residual oil zone. And we have an outcrop in the western part of the basin over near Roswell and Vaughn, New Mexico, that sweeps water in from the surface uh, and sweeps out the lower portion of these mega traps, these, this paleo trap that was in the geologic past. And so this area uh, can be completely swept in what we call a green field, uh, or it can be in an area below an existing field, which we call a brown field. And this particular spot that I've marked on the uh, slide here is, is an example of a brown field. And that might be a good example of a field we're gonna talk about in a few minutes, the Seminole field. Would you tell us more about all the different types of ROZ projects we have going on in the Permian Basin? Right now we've got 12 ongoing projects, four of which are at Seminole Field, several more at the Wasson Field, Vacuum Field, uh, Goldsmith Field, the George Allen Field. Uh, they're all actively looking and trying to recover oil from the residual oil zone. These are all brown fields, so they had existing production before the ROZ penetrations in production, and they were from the St. Andrews Formation, all the St. Andrews Formation. We have a, a map here that shows the location of those projects, and the red arrow points to a particular one, the Seminole Project we're going to talk about. What is an example of 
a good ROZ project? One of the longest ongoing projects is the Seminole project in Gaines County, north of Midland, about an hour. This project has been underway for since 1997, uh, and there are several sub-projects in it. Uh, the next few slides summarize some of the attributes of the, of the Seminole field in general and the ROZ in particular. And I'll kind of step through these and tell what these graphics are about. This particular one is, is, has the properties, the actual reservoir properties of it. This next one shows the distribution of the oil saturation. This actually shows the water saturation, but, but also the inverse of that's the, the water saturation. Um, through the depth interval of not only the ROZ, but up above it in the main pay zone. So you can see there's this zone of constant oil saturation of about 30 to 40 percent through a major part of the interval in the residual oil zone. It turns out that that number, that 30 to 40 percent, is very representative of the oil that's left behind after our water floods, in addition to here, which is Mother Nature's water flood. And then at the base, you can see what we like to call the paleo transition zone, where the oil saturation falls to zero over a finite interval. And the next slide is a table that shows some of the attributes of the fluids that are in the residual oil zone. This comes from a, a report that was published a couple of years ago uh, that is an SPE paper, and it shows that the properties of the oil, and the water too for that matter, are very much the same as they were in the main pay zone. So our conclusions would be that we ought to be able to flood these ROZ intervals just like we flooded the main pay zones many years ago. The Seminole field has been an ongoing project for quite some time. You want to describe some of the different stages that they've gone through with that production? Well, Hess uh, obviously wanted to step into this and, and do it slowly enough so they knew they were going in the right direction. And so they did a phase one pilot. They subsequently did several more sub-projects. Uh, the, the attributes of the particular projects are there on the screen. Uh, but let's describe a little bit about the phase one pilot. That was started in 1997. Uh, actually, in, in injection actually began the last part of 1996, and they watched the results of that in nine patterns, as shown on this graphic on the screen, and determined that it was indeed a, a successful pilot. So uh, what was the process like after, after they finished phase one? The conclusions of management suggested that a second pilot would be in order. And so what they did is they called a phase two pilot where they changed some of the attributes and, and operating conditions that they had in phase one. For example, one of the things that they did was concentrate the injection into the ROZ in dedicated wells, whereas in phase one pilot they were commingling the intervals, the main pay and the ROZ, in one well, and so they couldn't control how much CO2 was going into the main pay zone or the ROZ beneath it. They decided that they needed to do that in a phase two pilot, and that's what they did. They changed the geometry a little bit, the spacing of the wells was different, and so the net effect of this was reported in a, a paper given at our CO2 flooding conference in 2000 eight by uh, Scott Bijotti, and the results of that phase two pilot were reported and an extremely successful project in itself. What did the operators of the Seminole field do from there? Well, they got all the partners together in the field, uh, which are many, several other partners besides just the operator, and they all voted to go ahead full field. In other words, to do the ROS injection through the entire field, and of course they needed to step into that. It's a big field uh, with oh, probably 25,000 acres in total. And so what they did is they set up an initial sized area that was 29 patterns. And this is the stage one area that the, uh, we're showing on the screen. And they ended up adopting the same procedures they used in the phase two pilot. In other words, dedicated injection in the ROZ.
and the well spacing the same. What kind of oil production did Seminole CO2 EOR produce? Well, what we've got is the main pay zone first that was started back in the 80s. And then we've got the ROZ that was started with that pilot in 96, late 96. And then we, we moved on into stage one and stage two and now stage three full field production. And this graphic tries to summarize all of that. It also shows the decline that would have been projected if they had not done the CO2 EOR. And you see that uh, line that goes down to almost zero there in, in current time. And from that, you can deduce what production would be derivative of the existing water flood. And the difference between that and the current production would be the EOR production, uh, that due to the CO2 injection. And now you can see on the bottom of that, the, the red, where we've subtracted out the water flood production. And so this would be the production attributable completely to the CO2 EOR injection. And what you might notice there towards the end is that it's, it's deviated from the straight line uh, decline, and that's now due to the ROS projects that have been implemented since 96, 97. And so what we're starting to see is the residual oil zone EOR production on top of the main pay zone production that, uh, that was occurring. This slide is, is showing the individual sub-projects broken out and rather than just accumulated aggregate production from CO2 EOR, this is now showing the ROS projects broken out in addition to the main pay zone EOR production. And you can see there on the, uh, the one on the right scale that is the uh, production from the full field development, you can see it's climbed all the way up into the six to 7,000 barrels of oil a day production level. This graphic is a summary of the production for the various stages, the various sub-projects in Seminole, broken out by sub-projects. What are your predictions for Seminole's EOR ROZ future? Well, first thing I've got to tell you is that this is my forecast. It's, you know, I've analyzed the data from the public database, and so it's my forecast of what happens, and it's very dependent upon the amount of CO2 that a company can get its hands on to inject, and that's in tight supply today in the Permian Basin. So there's a, a, a bit of a caveat associated with this forecast, but you'll notice that this could get up into the 20,000 barrels a day range, given ample supplies of CO2. And so I think the answer to your question is where is it going? is that it's going to be very robust production due to the attributes of the ROZ, 30%, 40% oil saturation throughout that interval and the large area and large thickness of the ROZ. That sort of summarizes the residual oil zone history at the Seminole field and there's a series of references that we've used in trying to put all of this together to actually break out the individual sub-projects and do the forecasting. And on the screen, there's a list of, of those references that we've used. I know there are several ROZ projects out there besides just Seminole. What are your estimates of uh, the total combined oil recovery for these projects? Well, we, we mentioned the 12 projects that are ongoing. I've examined four of those in some detail. And I've tried to capture that in this graphic that's available here on the screen. And there's a lot of conservatism built in the, into these numbers, but it's pretty clear to our analysis that we're making at least 11,000 barrels of oil a day in the ROZ. And it's important to mention that that 11,000 barrels of oil a day coming from CO2 EOR in the residual oil zones would not be uh, available at all were it not for CO2 EOR. In other words, these zones would produce no oil in primary or secondary production. So we have in the Permian Basin around 11,000 or more barrels of oil a day coming from below the oil water contact in these reservoirs. That in comparison, say, to the million barrels of oil a day that we're producing out of the Permian Basin is, 
is more than a percent. So, and it's growing, and it's growing quickly. Well, thank you, Steve, for all the information you've shared with us today. Thank you. And thank all of you for watching. If you look down in the description, you can find links to all the resources discussed today. Thanks again. Until next time.